Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody happy and excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning. We're going to get started with prayer this morning before. Thank you, Lord. Father, once again, we're just so grateful to be in your house this morning, Father. Once again, we're grateful for all your many blessings. Lord, as we enter into your courts with thanksgiving, Father, we sing praises unto your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, everyone. Ooh, I, only, I didn't even hear anybody answer me today. Good morning, everyone. I think we're still asleep. I think we're still asleep. I'm trying to wake myself up drinking lots of water. How many of y'all are ready for worship today? Amen? So let's get on our feet and let's get ready to to party with the Lord.
Till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear child of God from my mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. sound of his voice and the 
know, because of everything that's going on in the world today, I, I was starting to feel fear. I was taking care of my grandkids yesterday, and I was going, what kind of future are we going to leave for my grandkids? And it was, it's that fear, you know, that's in, you know the truth, but it's in your flesh sometimes. You know, we live in this body of flesh, and, and sometimes, and so this morning, that was just perfect for me. <laughs> I mean, you know, who, why should I fear if the Lord is my strength? I keep my eyes on Jesus, amen? We're going to continue this morning worshiping the Lord with our tithes and offering. If you want to take a seat, you may. Uh, we're going to Proverbs 3, verse um, 9 and 10. And it says, it says, honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase. We're going to tithe. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Amen? That's the New King James Version, overflow. I've been contemplating. I'm thinking, you know, what does overflow look like? You know, I have all my bank accounts. I've got them open. I say, okay, Lord, I'm waiting for overflow. And so sometimes, you know, it's talking about money, so I'm thinking, you know, there's going to be an overflow, a bunch of money coming through, and sometimes it's not that way. Amen? But there is an overflow. And I wanted to testify this morning just real quickly, but um, Peggy is a part of this testimony, so I asked her permission to use her name. And as some, some of y'all know, Peggy is a single mom here, and she, get, she testified how the Lord has been blessing her. Y'all know she was in prison. She got out. Uh, about two years ago and how the Lord had blessed her to get her own apartment and all these things that people were blessing her with. Well, anyway, we had given her uh, a car that she could use and drive around in town and not anything reliable to go to Austin or San Marcos or anything like that. But it broke down one day and she was wondering, what should I do? You know, fix it. My husband uh, encouraged her, told her, you know, leave it alone. Maybe you could trade it in, get you something a little bit better, you know, go a little step higher. And so she started looking at newer used cars, and she went to three different uh, uh, places here in town and, and tried out some cars and thought, you know, this one might be within my reach. And they, sh the doors kept closing in her, in her face. They said, no, you don't make enough, or no, you don't have any credit. All right, zero credit. And so she kept, she was, she didn't get discouraged because we were there to encourage her. I said, the Lord has something for you. Don't give up. Keep your eyes on the Lord. Amen. When she first uh, got out, uh, we hired her to work with us. We told her, we can't pay you much, but this is what we can offer you. And she came to work with us, and I would visit with her. And she knew about giving, but she didn't understand um, tithing. So I explained to her, I taught her, and every day we touch on something, and, you know, I'd refer her back. And so she immediately caught on, and she started tithing. So she's been a faithful tither. And I know that that's difficult for a single parent, especially if you have, you know, you have children. And so, but she's been faithful in that. And so when she, uh, what the door kept, people kept saying no. She goes, I've made up my mind, I'm going to have to go with something maybe a little older, a little cheaper, that'll fit into my budget. And uh, I told her, well, first, prior to this, we were, sh my husband would go with her to try out the cars because he knows, he could tell if they've been damaged or whatever. But we went one Saturday with her to a dealership in Seguin. She had seen some cars online. So she went to try them out, and she tried to, and she liked the one, and, and, you know, when they go in to negotiate, you know, I stay out. I said, I don't want to, I don't like all that haggling. So me and her daughter stayed in the car, and we are waiting, and it was taking a while. So I told her, let's go find out what's going on. And, of course, they had her there, and they were already, well, look, here's the price. You know, you could take it today. It, your payment's going to be between 285 and 295 And I walked up, and I said, what's your budget? She had already told me. I said, that's way over your budget. I think she had placed 250 for herself. I said, that's too much. And I guess the lady that they were dealing with 
She kind of figured out by now we were Christian. So she tells Peggy real smart, she goes, oh, well, the Lord's going to provide. And then Peggy, I mean, right away said, yes, but the word also tells us to count the cost. And I was inside, I was going, yay, Peggy, high five. <laughs> good answer, good answer. And I said, so it doesn't match your budget. Let's go. And so, and so we left. I said, it's not your budget. Let's get out of here. It's not my time. Wait. So the, like, we're driving home, and the, and the lady keeps texting her. We could do 275. We could do 265. That's the most. And I said, no, it's not within your budget. Let it go. So over the weekend, that Monday, she came back. She goes, I made up my mind. Maybe I need to go cheaper. I've, I've come to the conclusion. I can't afford it. And I said, well, go to the bank. Go to your credit union. Apply for a loan and see how much you can qualify. And then you can see how much car you can buy. And they did. They said uh, she qualified for $10,000. But since she had no credit, it was 20% interest. I said, it's a start. Start with that. So then she made up her mind she was going to go back to this dealership because they did have a car that was under $10,000. And it was during the week. So Jesse went with her, and I stayed to work. And I prayed with her that morning. I said, God's got a car for you. So they left, and they, were, they, they called back, and she said, that car was no good. So, But the guy that was helping her this time, he goes, you know that car you were looking at last Saturday? I said, there's been a price reduction. I think it's 11 9 now. And that's a little bit closer to what she had because she had a car. Just said, trade in that car. And if you give a little bit down, you could get it down to your, to what, to your limit. So she did that. And they qualified her at 15% interest. I said, it was better than 20. And so that was the, the last we heard. And then she was waiting on, you know, her loan to show up on when her payments were going to start. And on top of that, they told her she had to, they gave her two months for the first payment. And so Friday, I think it was Friday, right? We were, Jesse and I were in the break room and she's running around the corner and she's all excited. And I said, what happened today? Because every day you have to expect good. And that morning, Sister Sandra, remember, we prayed something good is going to happen. We're going to hear good news today. And so she comes around the corner. She goes, guess what? My loan is finally showing up. I've got a payment. And they lowered my interest to 10%. <laughs> I said, hallelujah. And her payments were now, you know, I think went the second round, they went down to 238, which was in budget. But now she's down to like 200, five, six, something like that. And I said, that's the favor of God. And I said, that's God's favor on your life. And I, I stopped her. I said, wait, say, that's the favor of God, and that happens to me all the time, <laughs> amen, because we, we have to accept that from him, and so God is good, you know, God is so good, but the point on overflow is that that Friday, the Thursday, she got her car the next morning, as I was just, you know, meditating, the Lord said, that's overflow, you know, it was overflow, I could, I could have helped her but financially, maybe co-sign for her, and then, but, but then she'd be trusting in me. And the word says, trust in God. Amen. And the Lord said, that's overflow, even though. And then I started thinking, well, Lord, send her here. She's, uh, you know, our business, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the Lord. I'm a steward. He's made me a steward over it. So I'm an employee, too. And so that business is providing for 12 families. The Lord says, that's overflow. Amen. And so... And when she came, that's overflow. That's, she's being faithful, and the Lord has brought her down to 10%. And, you know, before I told her, you just pay your payments for six months. You can refinance, get a better deal. And that's still open, right? But that is, that is just so good how the hand of God, and she got the first car that she thought would be a safe car. It's a 2018. It's a new car. <laughs> Amen? Isn't that awesome? But the Lord is so good. Amen. So he's faithful, so we should be faithful. I mean, give whatever the Lord has placed in your heart. But y'all know me. You know, uh, to me, it's tithing. My husband and I, we don't tithe. We, we give over tithe because, that's, because we know it's for the kingdom of God. And, and we believe God's word, that he's faithful. 
and there's overflow and, the, and that the windows of heaven are going to open. And he's going to pour out a blessing. And we just believe his word. Amen. And that's what I want for y'all. That's what I wanted for Peggy. That's why I taught her the difference between giving and tithing. And look what the Lord has done. Amen. Glory to God. That is awesome. Uh, y'all can get a, give your tithes and offering, and then I will pray over you, over your offering. But in my house, for me in my house, we're going to be tithers. Amen? Right, brother? <laughs> Hallelujah, because God is good and he's faithful. Thank you, Lord. And if we have different ways of giving, you can bring your tithes and offering here. You can go to our online at bclawcard.com to our webpage and follow the prompts there. There's a giving tab, and then you can follow the prompts, and it'll take you where you need to give. Or you can do it by mail at P.O. Box 1399, Lockhart, Texas, 78644. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And I also told her when, when you tithe or when you give, you make sure that you're giving into good ground. And Vision Church of Lockhart is good ground because pastors are preaching the word of God. They're not watering it down. They're telling you the truth. And believe me, some of that steps on my toes because I'm sitting back there and I'm hearing Kyle, Pastor Kyle preach. And I'm going, ouch. I put my feet back. Ouch. He's stepping on my feet. And I know he's not directing it to me. It's the Lord. Amen. And so I want the same for y'all. I want y'all to be an overflow. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, because you're so faithful, Father, because you're a, a God of promises, Father. I thank, thank you, Lord, for all my brothers and sisters here this morning, Father, the ones that are giving here and online and, and by mail, Father. I pray, Father, that I pray overflow over their tithes and their offering, Lord. It's your word. It's your promise, Father, and that they would honor you, Lord. They would honor you, Lord. This world's getting to a place where they don't honor you, Father, but in this place, we're going to honor you, Lord, with this tithes and offering and believing, Father, that there's going to be overflow in my brothers' and sisters' homes and their finances, Father, that you would multiply to them 30, 60, and 100-fold, Father. We call it done in the name of Jesus because it's your promises, and we are believers that believe your word, Father. And we thank you this morning, Father. Thank you. Bless the stewards that steward over this money, Father. Give them wisdom to use it wisely, Father, for your kingdom glory, Father. And we thank you and we glorify you, Father, in everything we do and say. And we bless it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. God is good. So good to see everybody once again this morning. Everybody looks beautiful and handsome this morning. We're going to do our announcements before we get started with the word. We just want to remind everybody, you can visit the website at lockhart.com um, and for all our YouTube and Facebook um, services. And until further notice, we have here our guidelines. One, every other row will be blocked off. Two, families must sit at least two chairs apart from other families. Three, practice social distancing. And four, feel free to wear gloves and mask if you want to. And five, again, if you don't feel good, please exit the back door. No. We'll pray for you, and we will give you a call. If you don't feel good, call us. Let us know. We'll be happy to pray for you. And then join us online or in person on Wednesdays at 7. We're continuing the study on how to become a water walker. Pretty cool, huh? Water walker. And so it's going to be in our English and Spanish services. So, you know, you come to Wednesday nights, and I'm sure that it's a more intimate more in debt and not only that but it's a time for you to get to know one another personally and just get to hang out with one another and your faith will grow you know the more you're into the word of god the more we fellowship with one another it's awesome 
and you just begin to build your relationship with the Lord and with each other. So, And then, remember, last but not least, get ready for a very important day to remember. The last day to register to vote is Monday, October 5th for early voting. It's Tuesday, October the 13th through October the 30th. And election day is Tuesday, November 3rd. And you can visit votetexas.gov for more information. And we have flyers in the back, on the back table, for any information or stuff you need. It's back there. I don't know how many of y'all watched Saturday, the gathering that they had at Washington. Did anybody see that? Well, I heard it was awesome, and there was a bunch of people, and that's awesome. When you have a group of, massive group of God's people coming together to pray for our country. You know, we need to be doing that. So especially now that voting is coming up, we wanted to make sure that we we're in God's perfect will. And so Proverbs 14:34 says, Righteousness exalt a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So remember that. We want to be in God's will. We want to be in his favor. And um, so keep praying for our country and for the voting this coming November. That's it. Everybody looks awesome. We're glad to see you. And here's Pastor. All right. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Sister Sandra, for filling us in on uh, what's going on in the church. And um, we've got a lot more coming up in the future. Amen? God is good. We're excited. How many of y'all know we should be excited about uh, the future, right? But also be grounded in the present. Amen? Yeah, I saw those... I don't have anybody here see that yesterday, the uh, thousands gathered in Washington. Anybody here see that? It was awesome, wasn't it? Man, I was so encouraged by that. You know, sometimes you just feel like you're all alone in the world. You know, you feel like, man, why is everybody so dumb? <laughs> you know, you feel like you're one of the only smart ones in the world. And you're just like, what is it? <laughs> anybody else feel like that? Elijah felt like that. You know, he said, Lord, I'm alone to serve you. I'm alone <laughs> to to." to uphold morality and righteousness. He said, uh, everybody else has left you. But uh, I'll tell you, it's not true, but that's what the enemy would like us to think, that we're all alone, you know. But I'll tell you, there are a lot of people in this country who love the Lord, and um, it was just very encouraging to see all those thousands of people gathered together. And, um, you know, how, how many of you know that when I, when I saw that and I saw them worshiping yesterday, I mean... You know, forget a red wave, forget a blue wave, right? Democrats talk about a blue wave coming to the White House, and, and Republicans talk about a red wave. Listen, how about, a, how about a Jesus wave coming to America? Amen? Man, we need, we need revival in the hearts of people to awaken to God. Not religion, to awaken to God. Because religion hasn't helped at all. Amen? Praise God. It's just a, it's just a toothless dog. That's all religion is. And, um, you know, but I'll, I'll, I'll say I'm so excited about what God's doing in this country, you know, seeing that yesterday. And um, how many of you know that, again, talking about the red wave, blue wave, you know, a, a Republican or a Democrat, if you try to rule apart from God, how many of you know it's not going to work? You know why? Because the Bible says there is no good outside of God. He is good. There is no good outside of him. Amen? And so anybody who desires to rule or govern a people, and they don't have the Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts, how many of you know there's going to be different uh, uh, motivations that are going to rise up in their hearts that are not good? There's going to be lust, okay? Lust for power. There's going to be greed that's, that's rising up. And we, we see a lot of that in, in politicians, a lot of lust and a lot of greed. Why? Because if you don't have Christ in your heart, those things are only natural. Those things are of the flesh. Amen? And uh, so, you know, we, um, man, we need to be voting in godly leaders that can govern this, uh, this city, govern this uh, state, and govern our country. Amen? 
Thank you, Lord. All right, well, it's good to see everyone this morning. Good to, um, good to be here in the house of the Lord. The title of today's message is Rise Again. Rise Again. So let's go ahead and pray, and we're going to jump right in here. Father God, we just thank you so much for your word. You are faithful, God. You are so faithful, Lord. Your words, they will never fall to the ground, but they will always accomplish what they were sent to accomplish, God. We thank you there is power in your word, power to save, power to heal, power to set free, Father. And we just thank you this morning that we, we receive that from you. We receive your words into our heart. And we thank you for the fruit that it's going to bear in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want us to start over here in Proverbs 24 and, uh, and verse 15. Proverbs 24, 15. Thank you, Lord. 24, 15. And he says here, Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place. For a righteous man may fall seven times, and what? And rise again. But the wicked shall fall by calamity. Now, of course, the message today is on, on rising again. You know, how do we... How, how do we rise up? But I want to emphasize this point here first. And it, it, it's, it's this. Righteous people can fall too. You know? It says, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. As a matter of fact, a, a righteous person cannot just fall. They can fall multiple times. And you see that in the word of God. You see that with Peter. You know, you see that with, with Moses. You see that with Abraham, um, you see that with David, how they had a great reputation, okay? But they also had some mistakes and failures along the way. And, and they had to learn how to overcome these failures. They had to learn how to rise again when they fell down. They had to learn how to, you know, pick themselves up, essentially, when they were at some very, very low points in their life. And um, it's important for us to recognize that because... I think sometimes we create this, um, this fictional, you know, fantasy in our, in our head of, uh, of our, our heroes and those who have gone before us and those who are mighty men and women of God. And we think, you know, they've never, we, we have this in our head, like we think of them as though they've never fallen, you know. And so <clears throat> what that does is it harms us and, and it, it discourages us because we feel like, well, I've fallen many times, right? Nobody knows you like yourself. And you know the thoughts that you have. <laughs> and you know the times that you've fallen. You know the evil thoughts that come to you, you know, throughout the day and different things like that. And, um, and so it discourages you because you think, you know, I can't, I can't accomplish anything great. I can't do anything great like these people because... Our, our weaknesses, you know, we, we look at where we fall short. We look at our limitations which we're going to talk about a little bit later. We look at our limitations. And, but I'll tell you, you know, God's never called anyone perfect yet. Every single person that God has called has fallen at some point in their life, multiple times. Amen? So I just want to encourage you, if you have this idea in your head that if you fall, that you're not righteous or God doesn't love you or, you know, God's forsaken you or, or the calling of God is not as strong as on your life as it was before, I'll tell you, that's a lie. And you need to identify it as a lie in your mind and your heart. And you need to reject it. You need to rebuke it. Because the enemy is trying to steal from you. He's trying to steal your destiny and your purpose from you. Amen? Righteous people can fall too, multiple times. May fall seven times, but here's the thing about a righteous person, is they rise again. Amen? We must understand that just because we are people of faith, it doesn't mean that we won't have problems. Sometimes people think, you know, if you're strong in faith, you're not going to have any issues. You're not going to have any problems. You are, you know, impenetrable, right? Um, you cannot be plundered. And, and sometimes I hear people who are, um, you know, very into the faith message, which I am very for the faith message, but sometimes I hear people talk about themselves in faith almost like, you know, they're, they're just... 
they, they refuse to acknowledge a problem or, or they refuse to admit that, you know, as a person of faith, you can have problems. And I, I think this is, I think this is um, where we get into arrogance, you know, and, and we, we start thinking too highly of ourselves. And, and what happens with those kind of people who are real big into faith in, in, in that sense, we should all be big into faith, but because we're learning about faith on Wednesday nights, but big into faith in that sense to where you feel like you're impenetrable, like nothing can reach you, you cannot be touched by the enemy. Listen, if you are a man or woman of faith, you can be touched by the enemy. Amen. You can and you will be touched by the enemy. You are not more powerful than Paul, okay? You are not more important than Jesus. You will be touched by the enemy. You will be persecuted. You will fall at times in your life. Amen. So don't get into this arrogant attitude to where you feel like, um, you know, if I'm a person of faith, then the enemy has nothing on me. No, you're going to be touched. Okay, things are going to come against you. Don't, don't get discouraged. Amen? It's common. Jesus said, listen, if they persecuted me, right, don't you think they're going to persecute you? But they're not really coming after you. They're coming after you because of Christ in you. Amen? That's why in Chicago, it's crazy, you know, multiple shootings all the time, right? You got people just dying left and right in Chicago. And... Um, and, and here, uh, I forgot his name, Sean something. But anyways, he went to go lead, uh, he, he's traveling around the country, leading worship in, in different areas. And um, he went to the, to the city of Chicago to just lead worship. That's all he's trying to do, lead worship. And um, the mayor sent the police to, to keep him from setting up his platform to, to lead worship. And uh, he attracts thousands of people in every city he goes to, you know, but the mayor's like, no, we can loot and riot and burn things down, but no worship, <laughs> you know, can't worship. We, you know, there's, there's all these shootings and stuff, and God forbid that we should allow the love of Christ in to change the hearts of people, because that's the only way you're going you're, you're gonna, to, you know, fix things and change people. You know, people talk about this, um, I, it's very common today, you see it in the as slogans and things, you know, end racism, right, end racism. Well, I've got news for you. Racism will never be ended, ever. You know why? Because people are evil. I mean, Jesus is going to have to come back and kill everyone who's evil and hasn't trusted in him before, before we end these bad things. You know, you're not going to end poverty. Poverty will always exist. And this false thing of, well, if we do this policy and that policy, then we'll end poverty. You're, you're never going to end poverty. Amen? And so my point in, in saying this is um, racism will never be ended, but you want to know how to attack these things. Listen, you can create all the policies you want to create. Racism was outlawed, outlawed a long time ago. But I wonder why we still have racists. It was outlawed a long time ago. Shouldn't people just, if we outlaw it, shouldn't people just all of a sudden love everybody regardless of color? That's not how this works. The law does not touch the heart. Policy does not touch people's hearts. The love of Jesus Christ is the only hope that we have in this world, in this life. Amen? And the enemy is using people like that mayor in Chicago to, 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 to keep Jesus out. Amen? Even if you don't believe in Jesus, why would you not allow someone to come in and, and lead worship and your city is, needs some help. <laughs> Amen? So I'll tell you, we're fighting a spiritual battle here. And, um, but praise God, you know, right, righteous, I don't know how I got off hunt into all that, but, you know, righteous people can fall as well. And, um, and we need to understand that the world is going to persecute us. And that's okay if you have problems. It doesn't mean you're, you're weak in faith. It doesn't mean you're low in faith. If you fall, it doesn't mean God thinks less of you. Amen? So that's what we're going to talk about. Let's go to James 1.14. I want us to look at this scripture real quick. James 1.14. It says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Notice there in the beginning, it says, each one. Each one. 
All of us are tempted, aren't we? Each one of us are tempted. Each one of us have evil desires that dwell and exist in our flesh. Amen? All of us do. So the problem I have with people who claim to be so spiritual that they don't have problems is it's almost like they deny they have this flesh. And it doesn't matter how strong in faith you are. It doesn't matter how long you've been following the Lord for. It doesn't matter how spiritual you are or mature you are. You have flesh. And your flesh is contrary to the Spirit of God. Every day. And that's why the Bible tells us and instructs us to not be carnally minded, which feeds into the desires of the flesh, but to be spiritually minded. To live by the Spirit of God. Amen? Because this flesh, as long as you live here on this earth, is always present with you and willing to do that, which is contrary to the Spirit of God. The flesh is weak, but the Spirit is willing. Amen? It's willing to follow God. So for what I first want to do here, I want us to look at um, David's life and learn how David, how he fell and how he rose again. And it's not like it's just this thing to where David fell once and rose again and everything was just, you know, skippy like peanut butter from then on, you know? I mean, David fell and, and, and learned to rise again multiple times in his life. Multiple times, right? So let's go over here to 2 Samuel and, uh, and chapter 12 and verse 10. 2 Samuel 12:10. And um, I want us to look at, I always do this to the media team back there. <laughs> I want us to look at um, the life of David, and I want us to look at the consequence for him cheating, um, committing adultery with Bathsheba, and having Bathsheba's husband killed to cover up um, the child that was conceived in Bathsheba in sin. And here's the consequences of David's actions in, in 2 Samuel 12, 10. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of his son. And we learn later that it was Absalom, David's own son, that, um, that would lie with, with David's wives in the open. <clears throat> Verse 12, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, <clears throat> before the son. Verse 13, so how many of you know God's, God's not interested in, in, in your reputation? Do you understand? God's not interested and your reputation among men. Okay, some of us, we try, we, we try to uphold this, this perfect reputation in the sight of man. God doesn't care about that. God, see, God says here to David, you did this in secret. Nobody in Israel knows. Maybe a few, but not many. God says, I am going to punish you openly for what you did in secret. Amen? Amen? So it's important that we have the right heart towards God and understanding that it doesn't matter what anybody around me thinks because God knows my heart. And anything that lies in the darkness, eventually it will be brought to light. So it's better for you to bring it to light yourself and repent of it rather than someone else to bring it to light. It's better that way. Amen? Okay. Uh, verse 13. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. So this is good news. So David, immediately when he is confronted with his sin, he said, I have sinned. How many of you know that it's not, it's not good to make excuses? It's not good to justify your actions when you sin. David acknowledged, I have sinned. I messed up. And, and so he got some, a ray of hope here from Nathan uh, when, um, 
He said, the Lord, you know, you shall not die. Because David, David deserved to die, didn't he? Yeah. He deserved to be stoned. Verse 14, however, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. And then Nathan departed to his house. And some people say, well, that's not fair. Why, why does David's son have to die because of David's sin? I don't, know. I don't question the Lord. You know why? Because God is righteous and just in all that he does and all his decisions that he makes. And uh, so I don't question the Lord in his judgment. I think the better question is, why was David stupid enough to go ahead and have sex with Bathsheba and then kill her husband? That's the better question we should be asking. Amen. Um, <laughs> praise the Lord. So, you know, sometimes we ask the wrong questions, don't we? We question God. God, why this? Why that? And it's like, you're asking the wrong questions. Amen? And sometimes we ask those questions out of pride and out of arrogance, you know? Almost like, God, you answer to me. God has an answer to us. And God forbid we should ever think that he does. All right, verse 15, Then Nathan departed to his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it became ill. David therefore pleaded with God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. Laid all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. So we see this was a super low point in David's life. You know, David had, he had been faithful to the Lord. As a matter of fact, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, just a few chapters before, God made a promise to David and he said, look, David, I'm going to bless you like I've never blessed anyone. He said, I'm going to make a covenant with you that your bloodline shall always reign on the throne. Always. And he even made him the promise of the Messiah that was to come, coming through the bloodline of David. This was a great and magnificent uh, covenant and promise and blessing that God uh, had made with, uh, with David. And so David had seen the goodness of the Lord, the faithfulness of the Lord. David had seen how the God had won many battles for Israel and, um, and, and you know, had peace for Israel on all sides. And David had seen the goodness of the Lord in, in many different ways in his life. He had, uh, you know, wives and, you know, um, riches, and he had respect among the people in his kingdom. I mean, David had everything that a person could want, really. And yet here, he fell very hard in his life. And I'm sure he was feeling, for David, of course, I believe that he was sorrowful and, and, and weeping and, on the ground because of his son, for sure, you know. But also, I believe part of it was his heart was aching because he felt like he had let God down, in a sense. You know, God had blessed him so much and done so many things for him that were impossible. You know, defeating Goliath. And that's how David's path got, kind of got started there, with defeating Goliath. And... David probably felt, man, this is how I repay the Lord. After all he's done for me, after all he's given me, this is how I repay him. And um, David felt hard here. And he felt, probably felt like he was kind of at his wit's end where he was helpless in a sense. You know, God's never going to trust me again. God's never going to bless me again. And you start questioning yourself. Questioning, you know, life. You know, is, is, is life worth living? Is life worth going on? And, and I'm sure so many thoughts were going through David's mind, the sorrow, the pain, the grief that he was going through. And I want us to, um, I want us to look at something here. And I want us to look at life from a different perspective than the world. Because the world is always encouraging you, think positive, think positive, think positive. You know, if any negative thought comes, just that's bad. You know, that's just, everybody just think positive. And, um, you know, even Christian stations are doing that now. A lot of preachers are doing that. They're not even preaching the word. They're just motivating you, right? And God's not called us to be people who are just all about positivity and motivational speakers and things like that. Um, that's not what the word of God is about. And, and, and I want us to, to look at why here, why this time actually in David's life where he was so grieved, 
and would not eat and just laid on the ground and, and fasted and prayed and cried out to the Lord. I want us to see how significant this is. And I want you to see how significant it is that it's okay if you fall. I mean, it's not okay to sin. That's not what I'm saying. But if you fall, right? Um, and, and it doesn't have to be a sin for you to necessarily fall. It could just be a wrong decision or whatnot. But it's important what you do when you fall. What do you do at that low point in your life? Because that's a time where when you're fallen, that's a time where character can be built. That's a time where you can grow closer to the Lord than you ever have. Amen? And so I want us to see something here. You know, most people, they live for the high moments in life, but there's something beautiful about being broken. And this is really what the Lord says. He says, you know, God says, I, and I'm paraphrasing, but God says, I love a broken spirit. And again, I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what he's saying. I love a broken spirit. And here's why. I want us to go to Revelation 3.17. Revelation 3.17. I want us to see why it's so important <clears throat> that when we fall, we, um, we respond the righteous way. I want us to understand how we can make these failures actually work to our advantage. Here in Revelation 3.17, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And I want us to see this. Listen to this. Blessings on the outside can blind you to your eternal state. Do you understand that? External blessings can blind you to your internal state. I want us to think about that for a minute. Sometimes you don't realize how far away you are from God until you fall to the bottom. And then you think, man, I'm far from God. I've slipped in my relationship with God. But you know what? The truth is, you were, you were far from God when you were up here. But you just couldn't see it or feel it because you were so concerned with being up here. You're blessed on the outside. You have all your needs met. You know, yada, yada, yada. Everything looks good on the outside. External blessings can blind you to your internal state. It's important, whether you're up here or down here, that you are always evaluating your insides. Where is my heart? Where is the Lord in my life? Is he up here or is he down here? Amen? That's the message he's trying to portray here. Now, I want us to go to James 4, 9 through 10. James 4, verse 9 through 10. It says, Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves from the side of the Lord and he will lift you up. Now, th let me ask you this. Does this sound like, who, who's preaching this today? When you turn on K-Love, or I'm not against K-Love, okay? But I'm just saying, when you turn it on, or, you know, you... How many times are people preaching this, lament and mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom? How many people are preaching that? What is he talking about? He's talking about humbling yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Amen? Praise God. It's not this message of, you know, everybody just be positive and just frolic through life. No. People are frolicking through life, and they are depressed on the inside. So depressed on the inside. Amen. Man, we need, we need to get real, right? You know, what, our, just like on our sign outside, it, real Vision Church of Lockhart, real people, real power, real life. Listen, we understand we go through real life. 
and you are going to really fall sometimes. But listen, you can really rise again. And it's through the power of God. It's through humbling yourself. It's learning how to mourn, learning how to weep, learning how to, you know, be gloomy. And I'm not talking about a depression, you understand. And we're going to and we're going to get to that here in a second. I want us to go here to Ecclesiastes 7:2. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. In a second here, we're going to learn what I mean by being, you know, by mourning and being gloomy. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 2. Better to go to the house of mourning to the ho- than to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will take it to heart. Listen to verse 3. Sorrow is better than laughter. Somebody say that with me. Sorrow is better than laughter. When King Solomon, the wisest man, tells you that sorrow is better than laughter, guess what's better than laughter? Sorrow. (laughs) You better believe him. You better listen to him. He's wise. He knows what he's talking about. He's been in a place of laughter, and he's been in a place of sorrow. Sorrow is better. For by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. The heart is made better. We're not talking about the sorrow of the world. Okay, we're not talking about being oppressed in the world. We're talking about a godly kind of sorrow. The heart is made better when you repent, when you mourn, when you weep, when you call out to God in grief, the heart is made better. Instead of trying to stuff all that down and just, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be happy all the time. Happy, happy, happy. Let's be positive, positive, positive. No. That's not the Christian life. Are we full of the joy of the Lord? Yes, we're full of the joy of the Lord. But listen, it's good to mourn. It's good to sorrow, for the heart is made better. In verse 4, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. You know what that means? Amusement. Fools just want to amuse me, amuse me, amuse me. Well, we have a lot of fools today, because there's a lot of amusement going on from, from pulpits, there's a lot of amusement going on in various aspects of life. And it's in the church that's, that people are supposed to be receiving life. It's in the church that people are supposed to be maturing and growing in Christ, growing into the, to the fullness of Christ and, and who he is and who he wants to be in us. Amen? But if you're just focused on amuse me, amuse me, amuse me, Listen, God has no part in that. God is not here to amuse you. He'll be your joy. He'll be your peace. But he is not here to amuse you. Amen? Thank you, Lord. Uh, Let's let's go to 2 Corinthians 7.10. 2 Corinthians 7.10. Thank you, Lord. And I want us to look at the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. It says here in verse 10, For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves... What indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. So he says the sorrow of the world produces death. We're not talking about, you know, mourning and grief in the sense of depression, okay? We're talking about a godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is simply your response to the righteousness of God. That's what godly sorrow is. Okay, the worldly sorrow is like, you know... I want to kill myself because my girlfriend wants to break up with me. Okay, that's worldly sorrow. Okay? It's not the end of the world. I mean, no, seriously. I mean, people go through this kind of stuff. Some people actually want to, like, they feel like they can't live without a girlfriend or a boyfriend or whatever. That's a worldly sorrow. That's a, that's a, per, that's a fool who lives for amusement. That's what that is. That's no way to live. Okay? I don't care whether you're older or young people. Listen, that's no way to live. Let him go. <laughs> Let him go. Honestly, <clears throat> that's a worldly sorrow. Um, 
Praise the Lord. I thought about saying something, but I don't know if I should, which means I probably shouldn't. So, <laughs> but a godly sorrow is, is, a, is a response to the righteousness of God. It sees God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's standard. And it's a sorrow that's produced in our hearts because we feel like I've fallen short. I've fallen short of that. God, I said something I shouldn't have said. I did something that was, you know, was not who I am. Because just like we sang that song, I'm no longer a child of fear. I'm sorry, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Right? The Bible says in Romans, the Holy Spirit cries out in our hearts, Abba, Father. Why? Because we are children of God. That's who we are. We are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So when we sin, we say, Father, we mourn, we grieve. We, we, we grieve. Why? Why do we do that? Because we see, I did something, I said something. That's not who I am. That's not who I am. And you get back into that place of fellowship with God. Of It's not like you ever lose fellowship with God, but sin does harden your heart and dulls your senses to the spirit of God. And so what happens is you're not changing, you're not changing God when you repent, but what you're doing... <clears throat> is you're getting back to that place of making your heart sensitive to the righteousness of God again. The world is so lost, the world doesn't even discern what's righteous and what's not righteous. Amen? Why? Because uh, they've created their own righteousness. Right? <clears throat> they've created their own right. Their own righteousness is to accept everybody the way they are and that it's okay. It's okay to be gay. It's okay to be this. It's okay to be that. It's not okay. It's not right. It's not okay. And it will lead to worse things if, if you continue down that path of exalting your own righteousness above the righteousness of God. Amen? <clears throat> so that's what a godly sorrow is. It's, <clears throat> excuse me, responding the right way to the righteousness of God. Amen? Let's go over here to, and you know what? In verse 11, <clears throat> the beauty of godly sorrow is that what it says here, what diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves. The beauty of godly sorrow is it frees you up on the inside. It, it's, it clears your soul. Godly sorrow is a purifying of the soul. That's what it is. It clears you up. It's a purifying, a clearing of the soul. That's why God encourages us and tells us uh, that's why King Solomon tells us to uh, sorrow is better than laughter. Now, let's go to 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, <clears throat> and verse 9 and 10. Thank you, Lord. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The hope of glory. You're, see, when you feel the, sometimes when you feel the weakest, when I have felt the, the worst in my life and the weakest in my life, I have experienced the power of God more than I ever have when I felt strong in life. And that's exactly what he's talking about here. Now, <clears throat> I want us to read some different translations here to help us get a better understanding of what he's saying. So in verse 7, in, and they don't have this up in the back, but that's the way. In 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, in the message translation, it says, because, or not translation, message Bible. Okay, the message Bible is not a translation. It's just, uh, anyways. Because of the extravagance of those revelations, and so I wouldn't get a big head, I was given the gift of a handicap to keep me in constant touch with my limitations. Satan's angel did his best to get me down. What he, in fact, did was push me to my knees. And in verse 9, what the message uh, Bible says, my grace, God says, my grace is enough, it's all you need. My strength comes into its own in your, uh, in your weakness. So our limitations lead us to see our need for God 
and opens up the door for his unlimited peace, joy, and strength to shine in us. That's why Paul said, I glory in my weaknesses, I glory in my limitations, because it creates an opportunity. So when you're low, when you fall, don't wallow. Don't be filled with self-pity. Respond to God. Respond in faith. There at that low point in your life, you can grow. You can rise again. Okay? But you need to seek God. You need to seek him like you never had. You need to stop pretending like God doesn't see everything about you. You need to open up your heart to him completely and fully. You need to reveal your most secret, intimate thoughts to the Lord. Not that God doesn't already know them, but you need to just openly let him in. Amen? Amen. Grief and mourn. That's what this does for you. Recognize your limitations. In the, the Passion Translation, in, uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, the Passion Translation, my power finds its full expression, <clears throat> God says here, my power finds its full expression through your weakness. Through your weakness. And this is what Paul says. So I will celebrate my weaknesses, for when I'm weak, I sense more deeply the mighty power of Christ living in me. And in verse 10, Paul says, for my weakness becomes a portal to God's power. My weakness becomes a portal to God's power. This is huge. Huge. Amen? Rather than trying to pretend you're something you're not and then just shove everything down and pretend like everything's okay, why don't you just weep? Why don't you just sorrow and mourn and grieve instead of trying to pretend like everything's okay because you're righteous and you're, you're supposed to be walking by faith and you've got to pretend like everything's okay. Now, I'm not saying to go around town just, you know, Everybody feels sorry for me. I'm talking about between you and the Lord in that secret place. Stop pretending like everything's okay. When on the inside, you're poor, you're naked, you're wretched, you're cold. Amen? It's not time for you to be positive. It's time for you to grieve and mourn and weep and sorrow. And it's in those places when we're fallen, when you embrace that, you're transformed. God does something amazing in your heart. You develop this closeness, closeness with the Lord that you would have never developed otherwise. Amen? God is with you. He wants to be with you through the highs and the lows. Now, I want us to look at verse 20 in 2 Samuel 12, 20. Let's go back over there. I want us to look at David, how he rose again. And there's con more context to this that you can read if you desire in your own time. But it says here in 2 Samuel 12, 20, So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went to his own house, and when he requested, they set food before him, and he ate. This is right after he knew that his son had died. No longer what his, was his son dying, his son had died. That was it. And look at David's response. He rose again to worship the Lord. And I'm telling you, if you will mourn and grieve and sorrow when you're at the bottom, you will rise again stronger, wiser, more mature, and just more prepared for life. But listen, if you try to justify your sin when you're, when you're fallen, if you try to shove everything deep down and try to pretend like everything's okay and just be positive and, and you don't want to make a change, listen, repentance without change is dead. It means nothing to God. Okay? It's so important that we embrace these things when we're fallen. Amen? Amen? And all of us have and will fall. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want, us to look at, I want us to look at the life of Peter real quick. And I'm just going to go through this really fast because I want us to get this one thing. This one thing. This is so beautiful about the love of God. In Matthew 26, 31, let's go here real quick. Matthew 26, 31. Jesus said to them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. 
For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Jesus spoke this, and um, this is when he was about to be betrayed and crucified. And I want us to jump over to verse 69. 69. And uh, let me turn over there. <clears throat> Matthew 26, 69. And now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came with to him, saying, You also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know what you are saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow uh, also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear. Does that sound like a righteous man? Well, Peter had fallen, okay? <laughs> I do not know the man. Immediately, it says, a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Wept bitterly. This is beautiful. I know it doesn't look like it, but I'm telling you, it's beautiful in the eyes of God when you sorrow and weep and godly sorrow. When you mess up and you fall, because God wants to restore you, but you've got to have this repentance, a repentant heart. Amen. Now, I want us to look at Luke 22, 61. This gives a different, uh, when, when Peter, um, it says repeat, in verse 75, Peter remembered the word of Jesus, and then he began to weep, right? And, but here in Luke 20, uh, 22, 61, it says, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So, and then Peter wept bitterly then. But it says Jesus looked at him. Can you imagine the shame that Peter felt at this moment in his life? Can you imagine how little, how low he felt that he had abandoned the Lord at his most desperate time of need? This was a very low point in Peter's life. And, and yet we see the faithfulness of the Lord in John chapter 21. We see how God restored Peter. And Jesus told Peter, said, Peter, do you love me? Tend my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Right? And Peter said, yes, Lord, I love you. Jesus essentially called Peter back into the ministry. And I want us to look at John 21, 22. John 21, 22, Jesus said to him, Peter, if, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? He said, you follow me. So Jesus is still telling Peter, even after he denied him, even after he messed up, even after he felt this shame and wept bitterly, he's telling Peter, follow me. What is he saying? There, Peter, you can rise again. I haven't forsaken you. I'm not done with you. That just shows the love that God has for us. And I want us to look at Mark 16, 7. Mark 16, 7. This really stood out to me the other day. This is when Peter had, again, he messed up, was shamed. The angel, when, um, when uh, you know, Mary and, and the Marys, I call them the Marys, they went to the tomb of Jesus, and the, Jesus wasn't there, right? The stone was rolled away, Jesus wasn't there, but the angel was. And this is what the angel said to them. But go. Tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Peter is a disciple of Jesus, right? Why did the angel have to call out Peter by name? I love this. You know why? Because God is love. And what this message that God gave the angel, what God was trying to say to Peter was that, Peter, even though you forsook me when I needed you, even though you felt all this shame and felt low and wept bitterly, God is saying to Peter, I still know your name. Isn't that beautiful? Thank you, Lord. I don't know what this does for you, but this does everything for me. To know that God still knows my name when I fall, when I displease him. He still knows my name. 
I'm telling you this morning, he still knows your name. And he is calling you to rise again. I want us to go to these last scriptures here and then we'll be finished. Isaiah 61, verse 1. Isaiah 61. Verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the openings of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. I love this because this is what the Lord is telling me when telling us when you're poor, when you're brokenhearted, when you're captive, when you're bound, when you're mourning, when when you're in sitting in a pile of ashes of your own destruction. Amen. When the spirit of heaviness is upon you, this is only an opportunity. As we read in in second Corinthians, this is only an opportunity for the Lord's anointing for his good news to lift you up for his healing power to restore you, for his liberty to overtake you, for him to open the prison doors of your life, for him to comfort you, to take vengeance on your enemies, to console you, to beautify you once again. Amen? To pour over you the oil of joy, to put on you the garment of praise, And the Lord does this because we do not have to be a tree that is broke, depressed, and sickly. We don't have to stay down. The Lord is saying, you are the righteousness of me. And when you're down, you just need to dig deep and let God plant you. And then you will flourish as the righteous tree that he has called you to be. Do you understand this? I pray we get this in our hearts. It's not a bad thing if you fall. A righteous man may fall seven times, but they get back up again. But what you do when you're down there makes all the difference. Amen? Let's go ahead and stand this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, we are so thankful for your word that you have brought forth this morning. God, I pray that your word would not fall on deaf ears, but that we would take your words to heart and realize that your spirit is calling us. When we fall, he is calling us to sorrow, to mourn, to grieve, to to reconnect with you, God. We thank you, Father, that no matter what, you never leave us, you never forsake us, you never forget us, you never forget our name. And it's so beautiful to think of your love, of your commitment to us, God, that you will never be unfaithful. Even when we are faithless or unfaithful, God, you remain faithful. And we thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're here, you're watching online, listen, I don't want you to leave here or turn this this live video off without you receiving the Lord as, as Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I don't want that to happen. The time is short. The days are being are are seemingly becoming shorter. And um, I'll tell you, we need to our hope needs to rest in the Lord. Amen. Praise God. I want you to know that Jesus shed his blood for you. All you need to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that he is Lord. And the Bible says you will be saved. You will be saved for sure the Spirit of God bearing witness with you that you are a child of God. Amen? So I want us to go ahead and pray this together. And for those of you watching online, pray this with us. Say, Father God, I thank you for your love for me. I thank you for not abandoning me. Today, this hour, this moment, I receive you into my heart. I receive all of you, all of your forgiveness, all of your healing, all of your joy and peace, all of your love. Fill me with yourself, God. 
Fill me with your righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. When I prayed that, I just felt the Spirit of God said, and I have. Amen? So if you prayed that from your heart, the Spirit of God has, and He has not just done that, but He has done so willingly and joyfully to fill your life with Himself. Amen? We serve a good God. I'll tell you, before we, before we leave today, if you gave your life to the Lord, I want you to see Sister Sandra here in service. She's got some material she wants to bless you with. If you're watching online, you gave your life to the Lord, we want to bless you with some material. Either comment below or message us directly, and we will get that material to you. Um, but with that being said, let's go ahead and pray, and we will be dismissed. Father God, we just thank you for this day, God, the joy of life, the, the oil of gladness and joy that you have poured over us this morning, Father God. We will go out and spread this oil, spread this joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful uh, week. And Sister Sandra will be up here in the front if you need prayers.